Hello everyone, welcome to this class on D. Gary Young. He is the founder, starter, the owner of Young Living Essential Oils. And this is the cover of the book that we're covering today. Really only half the book, that's why it's an introduction. So let's get started. There's a lot of information. This guy is amazing. So let's uh, move on. So he's born in 1949. He grew up with his mom and dad, five siblings. And this is the cabin, or one of the cabins, that his father built. It was around 12 miles from any town. It had no electricity or running water. Yeah, that's not going to work for me. When he was 18 years old, he moved to British Columbia, Canada. And he got in on the last homestead act which is where I guess they were giving away land in Canada. And he got 320 acres in the wilderness and began to build a horse ranch. And he started a logging business. Unfortunately, at the young age of 24, Gary Young suffered a very severe logging accident when a cut tree sheared off and hit him right on the head. Now, this resulted in, check this list out, this is crazy. Three open skull fractures, spinal cord ruptured in three places, 11 ruptured discs, 16 broken or crushed vertebrae, a broken pelvis, right scapula broken in nine places, severed brachial plexus. I don't even know what that is, but it sounds bad. 19 broken bones, including all, yes, all the ribs on his right side. I mean, it was just nuts. Here's uh, some x-rays of some of the craziness here. And he suffered intense pain, and he could only use his left arm. That's really all he could use. He was confined to a wheelchair, and he was told he'd never walk again. He was taking 13 different drugs, and including morphine and an antidepressant. Now, after two failed attempts at suicide he sunk into an even deeper state of depression. He had no insurance, and he was slowly losing everything because of the medical bills. His logging equipment was the first to go, then his ranch, his livestock, and this is where it gets really bad. Even his wife left him and took the children with her. Just brutal, right? So he had a third attempt at suicide, but this one was a little bit different. He decided here to fast himself to death. In other words, not eating. He thought that was his only way out, that no one could rescue him because no one could really force him to eat. So he was only drinking water with lemon juice. Um, and this went on, this is crazy here, 253 days. 253 days of just eating um, or drinking water with lemon. But here's the thing, this unexpected thing happened. After so many days, he actually felt movement in his right toe. And he didn't want to get his hopes up, so he went to the doctors, and they suspected that it was probably because he was fasting, that his body did not get the nutrients that were necessary to manufacture scar tissue, which enabled some of his nerve endings to, I guess reroute themselves or reconnect. So he eventually stopped taking all of his medications. He just wanted to clear his mind and he began to pour himself into studying herbs and natural healing because, hey, if water and lemon can have this effect on me, then there's got to be some other like really cool natural stuff out there that can help me even more. So he started studying herbs, natural healing, and all of that. Through 13 years of constant debilitating pain and frustration, Gary, and this is a miracle from God, I believe, Gary went from a wheelchair to a walker, to crutches, to a cane, to very painful slow walking. But when he did start walking again on his own, even though it was excruciatingly painful, this kept him determined to discover new possibilities of healing. So eventually he moved to Southern California where he continued with his education 
by enrolling in a naturopathic college where he learned all kinds of natural healing and the body can heal itself through natural ways and the ways that you eat and herbs and all that kind of thing. At the same time, he opened a small office and a research center for physical and emotional well-being. Here's the sign, the arrow's pointing to it. Here's a kind of a blow-up of what was called Young Life Wellness Center. Here's his lab on the phone here. And this is all in Southern California. Well, in 1985, this woman came all the way from Switzerland I don't know how she heard about his research center, but she came to find help. She had been studying essential oils for many years. So she gave Gary some research that she had translated from French because she felt that he might be interested. And he actually, she actually invited him to a conference in Geneva where doctors would be presenting their research on essential oils. So he went from Southern California all the way to Geneva, Switzerland. And so while he was there, he learned a lot about essential oils from all these doctors making presentations. And that's where his essential oil journey began. Now, a few French doctors that he met at the conference invited him to their hospital where they were conducting all types of research on actual patients with essential oil. Gary Young was fascinated, and his questions were endless. He returned home with 13 essential oils, and uh, <laughs> he started experimenting with them to discover and learn more about their usage and application. Here's the thing. There was no books available in English about essential oils, let alone anything on usage or application. So with no written information in the U.S., no internet yet, and virtually no one with any conclusive experience, the frontier was all his. He did massive amounts of experimenting with his 13 essential oils, and he made some exciting discoveries. His thirst for knowledge led him to want to study about essential oil distillation. But here's the thing. If you want to learn about distillation, you got to go to France. Because that's where you learn about distillation when it comes to essential oils. The problem is that Gary didn't know anyone involved in the field. He didn't know anyone in France, for that matter, except those few doctors he had met. And to make matters worse... Um, the French were not exactly open to sharing their quote-unquote secrets, especially to some young American. But that didn't stop Gary Young. He flew to France, and he was determined to learn about essential oil distillation. But he just wasn't having too much luck. Well, in 1988, Gary sold his research center in SoCal, and he moved to Nevada to start a new business. It was a marketing company for his health products called Young Living. And yes, because of his research and all of that, he started developing his own health products. And a year later, Gary moved his headquarters to Spokane, Washington, and devoted himself to his research and to growing his business, Young Living. In 1990, at a conference or an expo for health in California... Gary Young met this guy named Jean-Noël Landon, or Landell, sorry. Now, Landell was visiting from France, and he was trying to sell lavender oil, see if he could find a buyer for his lavender oil. And so he met Gary Young, and they quickly discovered a mutual interest in essential oils. And a month later, Gary went to France to learn more about essential oils. In 1991, Landell introduced Gary Young to this guy named Philippe Mailhabea, who was writing and teaching about essential oils. And it was um, through his relationship with Philippe that Gary Young learned about the fact that essential oils can have emotional effects on people. There are emotional aspects to essential oils. This guy, Philippe, knew that essential oils could break the brain-blood barrier and affect our moods and our attitudes and our emotions and all of that. This opened just a total new world 
for Gary Young, and he started researching that on his own as well. Now, these two French connections were extremely helpful in educating him about essential oils, but mm, there's, he still wasn't learning anything about the distillation process itself. Now, uh, this guy here, Jean-Noël Landel, eventually introduced him to a guy named Marcel Espiau. Now, he was the president at the time of the French Lavenders, French Lavender Growers Association. Now, initially, like any other French person, Marcel was not receptive to this curious American who kept asking all these questions. However, over time, Marcel saw how serious Gary was and invited him to actually see his distillery. Now, Gary was so enthralled by seeing the distillation process, and he wanted to learn so much that he volunteered so many hours and days and nights in the distillery of Marcel. He would be filling the firebox with wood and doing any menial tasks that Marcel would ask him to do. He just couldn't get away. He wanted to soak it all up like a sponge and learn all about the distillation process. So Marcel began to trust Gary more and more, and developed a friendship with Gary, um, a, a friendship that, would de that was destined to last a lifetime. So Marcel decided to teach Gary everything he knew. So that was a huge step for Gary Young. But there was one expert that Gary wanted to learn from more than anyone else. His name was Henry Vayud, and he was considered the father of of distillation. Gary tried for five long years to meet him and to talk with him, but Henry was not interested in teaching anyone, much less Americans. But Gary's persistence finally paid off. Over dinner at Landell's house, Henry asked Gary Young what essential oils meant to him. And here was Gary's response. He said, I believe that essential oils are the closest physical and tangible substance that carries the Spirit of God on earth. What an amazing statement, right? Well, Henry Vayud liked what he heard. And he decided to allow this guy, Gary Young, into his life and to teach him everything that he knew. Here's a picture of Gary Young with Bayoud and also with Landell. Well, Gary learned a lot, a lot from the father of distillation. He took meticulous notes. Everything he heard, he wrote it down. <coughs> well, Gary brought some lavender seeds home with him to Spokane, Washington, and he planted them in a quarter acre of land behind his business building. And the seeds germinated and grew into beautiful, healthy plants. They grew bigger the next year. And Gary was anxious to see if he could produce oil from them. Now, referring to his meticulous notes from his mentors in France, especially Vayud, um, and using his own creativity, he began to make his very first essential oil distiller by welding, check this out, two pressure cookers together. Now, even though his lavender plants were only two years old, and that really was against what he learned in France, he went for it anyway. With his two-year-old lavender plants, he produced three milliliters of lavender oil. Now, he had the oil tested, and to his surprise, the quality was excellent. This motivated Gary Young to build two more experimental distillers, each one a little bigger than the one before. It was obvious that Gary, it was obvious to Gary that he needed more land in order to grow more plants for his new company and of course to further his research. So in 1992 he purchased his first farm, 160 acres in St. Mary's, Idaho. The farm was remote and untouched by chemicals. It had not been plowed in over 50 years, and the soil had an acid pH that was way too low. So he started to work just one acre at a time, 
and he had to till several tons of manure, microbes, enzymes, and other natural ingredients to get the pH level um, up to where he could plant lavender. Members of his fledgling new Young Living team volunteered their time to help plant the lavender by hand. This was the same lavender that was planted behind his building in Washington. The same lavender that came from seeds he brought home from France. Now in Idaho, he also designed his largest distiller yet. Take a look at this beast of a distiller he's putting together here. Um, and uh, it was great. It worked really well. Peppermint was the first plant that he distilled, and it was exquisite. This motivated Gary to make even bigger distillers, which in turn motivated him to plant more and more crops. Now, unfortunately, machinery for harvesting aromatic plants did not exist in the United States. Gary had to buy regular farming equipment and modify it. Here he is, you know, modifying whatever he bought there. And, and all, he also had to buy a few machines that he would bring in, like this, uh, this harvester here from France. Um, and so this machine up here um, is amazing. He, he created this thing, so instead of having to plant by hand all these people, he, he, he set up this tractor where there was three seats right here. Three people could sit and take these tiny little fledgling seedlings and, 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 and plant them as they go. And it just worked really well. They used that for a very, very long time. So you might be wondering, how does distillation work? Well, take a look at this chart here. First of all, you need a heat source. And the, the fire then warms, or the, or, or the, you know, well, the fire, let's just call it that. It boils the water. This is just plain, plain old water, and it creates steam. Here's the steam. The steam comes up and goes through this tube here into the, the bottom of the extraction chamber. Now, this is full of plant material. Could be lavender, could be peppermint, you know, it could be little pieces grinded, it could be crushed, it could be whole plants. And the steam rises up through the plant material. They call it the cooker. Now, as it travels through the plant material, it causes the plant membranes to open and release the oil vapor. Now, the oil vapor then mixes with the steam and goes up through here and then into this chamber right here um, where it cools. And as it cools, the steam becomes water and the oil vapor becomes oil and comes down into this container here. Now, as everyone knows, oil doesn't mix very well with water. Um, it's lighter than water. Water is heavier. So the water, the floral water, which is water that's now kind of has a smell to it because of the uh, oil vapor, would be at the bottom and the essential oil would rise to the top and you can just kind of pull it out from here into a container. Now keep in mind, every plant has a different distillation process. Each plant species must be grown a certain way, harvested a certain way, distilled with a certain time frame, distilled in a certain temperature for a, spe a specified duration. With each plant and each plant species having its own temperament, if you will, this is why it takes so many years to master the art of distillation. And let me tell you, when it came to distillation, Gary Young questioned everything. How hot should the steam be? How long should the plant material be steamed? Um, do plants give more oil if they're placed in the distiller hole? Should they be broken into pieces or grinded up? How soon after harvesting should each plant be distilled? The questions never ceased for Gary Young. And after many, many years of experimentation, he had many plants down to a science. Now, this is an interesting thing I found. This is like, I love this. Um, you know how after distillation, there's that separation. Here's, you can see it right here. There's the oil and there's kind of the floral water. Well, there's, there's the floral water. He didn't even want to waste the floral water. This is incredible. Um, because he said it, it contains micromolecules of the plant from the distillation process. So because he didn't want to go to waste, here's what he did. He put that floral water into a hot tub. Seriously. 
into a hot tub at his farm in Idaho so people could relax while soaking in the floral water. And people who have taken advantage of this and soaked in it say that it is rejuvenating and energizing. It's like your skin is soaking up all these micronutrients. I'd love to give that a try. Well, in 1993, Gary moved his company, Young Living Essential Oils, to an 8,000 square foot building in Utah. Uh, within about a year's time, that building was too small. That's how fast his company was growing. So he bought this old abandoned elementary school to become their next headquarters. The old kitchen of the school became the laboratory. The cafeteria was retrofitted for production. The gymnasium became the shipping department. And Young Living was incorporated the following year. In 1995... Gary bought a 160-acre farm in Mona, Utah, his second farm, because several crops were just not growing well in Idaho, and plus he just needed more space to grow. An example of a crop that wasn't doing well in Idaho was sage, because deer were just hopping fences and doing whatever they had to do to eat up all the sage. And also thyme. Gophers loved feeding on the roots of thyme plants. But in Utah, both crops flourished. In 1996, it became evident to Gary Young that he needed to be able to do testing in-house. Now, third-party unbiased testing is very important, but the problem is the results are not delivered quick enough, and Gary wanted to know immediately if he had to make any changes to the distillation process of a certain batch of plants so that the oils could be the highest quality. In other words, if he tested immediately and got the results immediately, he would know, oh, we need to cook it longer or, or raise the temperature or, or you know, all kinds of things like that. He could make adjustments to make sure the quality was excellent. So he went to Anadolu University in Turkey, and he studied with Dr. Hans Baser. Um, he, Dr. Hans Baser, this guy here, is an expert in gas chromatography. And so Gary completed 120 intense hours of study to learn this testing procedure. And with this knowledge, Gary could differentiate between different species of the same oil to understand why one particular oil had greater benefits than the other, even though maybe it was all lavender, just different species of lavender. Gary also found that he could blend essential oils according to their chemical compounds, which could actually amplify the body's response to the oils. So he started playing around with different oil blends. So Gary, with all this knowledge um, about testing, immediately began building laboratories in his farms for testing and for research. That same year, he also bought a farm in France. It already had lavender growing in it, and it had not been treated with chemicals or pesticides, so it was perfect for his organic growing. It was the first foreign-owned lavender farm in that region of France, the first foreign-owned farm. The other lavender farmers did not like it at all, but Gary slowly became acquainted with all of them. And as they witnessed his dedication to lavender farming, they became very curious as to why Gary was so adamant about not using chemicals. But he would tell them, quote, feeding and nourishing the soil will produce better quality oils. Throughout the years, as Gary went back and forth to France and he continued learning and checking out his French farm there, he observed that the lavender in that region was slowly dying. And the theory is that the plants had weakened immunity after so many years of chemical fertilizers and pesticides. <coughs> so, in 2010, Gary brought seed from Idaho to France for planting. This lavender originally came from France. Remember, he brought the seeds with him back to Spokane, Washington. And these plants and the seeds were finally returned to France after about 20 years in the U.S. Amazingly, this was the only lavender that went into full bloom. 
Look at this picture here, comparing the French lavender over here with the lavender that he brought from the United States that he grew organically without, um, without chemical fertilizers or without pesticides or anything like that. They didn't have that weakened immunity. And look how beautiful they look compared to the French one. There's just no comparisons. Well, Benoit Cassan, the current president of the French Lavender Growers Association, said this when he saw the comparison. The St. Mary's Lavender looks like the true French Lavender we grew 50 years ago and is the only lavender that produced two crops this year. High praise from the French growers, for sure. To take it a step further, in 2011, this uh, president of the French Growers Association, Benoit Cassan, he joined up with Jean-Noël Landel, the guy we learned about earlier, and the two of them, and another guy actually, merged their farms with Gary Young's to form one Young Living Farm System in France. And today... It is the largest true lavender farm in the world. In 2002, Marcel Espiu, remember him, the former president of the French Lavender Growers Association? Well, he finally came to the U.S. to see what Gary Young had built. He saw the organic farming, the detail that Gary Young took in making sure that the soil had the correct pH the composting and nourishment of the soil and the crops, the weed and pest control that was all natural, using essential oils to control weeds and to control the pests. And even though it was way more expensive to control weeds and pests doing it that way, um, he chose to do it because it was healthier for the plant. And not only that, Marcel saw the advanced distilling process that produced incredibly high quality of oil. Now, he happened to come during the time of the Young Living Convention. And on the farm day, you see a picture of him right here holding the microphone. And they say he had tears in his eyes when he spoke to the group and he said this to them about Gary Young. The student has now become the teacher. Incredible story how this man right here, D. Gary Young, became the modern father of essential oil distillation. Called that by many, many essential oil people. Long journey for him, but it's clear that the man was passionate about learning, farming, learning, distillation, learning the process to make essential oils at the highest quality level possible. So much so that Marcellus Bew said the student has now become the teacher. Well, I hope you enjoyed this first half of the Gary D or D. Gary Young book. And at some point I'll cover the second half.